Constructing your life is about much more than just building a bank account. Each week, join real estate entrepreneur and mindset coach Austin Linney as he interviews guests who are constructing their dream lives and impacting the world around them on a daily basis. If you're an entrepreneur or wanting to start a business, or you just want to hear motivating stories of how others have overcome the odds, you are in the right place. And now for your host, Austin Linney. Guys, welcome back to Construct Your Life. Stop talking, Chris. Uh, welcome back to Construct Your Life. See, that's how you got to do, guys. You, you got to put them in their place. No, I'm just kidding. Dude, this is the only guy that looks better than me. The only guy. I will only give this guy the credit. Uh, we have Chris in the house. How are you doing, my brother? Good, man. Way to turn me all beat red at the beginning of this call. <laughs> yes. No, I appreciate it, brother. Dude, thanks for having I, me on, man. I really appreciate man, it. Man, I'm so looking forward to this conversation. So, what I like to do with my guests, like you've had a crazy last couple, like a year or so, uh, a lot of pivots, a lot of changes. Uh, I'll let you kind of tell your story and then we'll go from there. Yeah, for sure, man. So, I'll make it quick as far as like the childhood. You know, grew up with my mom and my sister. Uh, my older brother is most definitely a, a personal and professional mentor to me, but technically my half brother. So, he was with dad a lot. Uh, so growing up without a father, man, it was um, it was non-traditional in a lot of ways, but I've used that as fuel to be where I'm at today and where I want to go. Definitely not where I want to be by any means. But um, yeah, I was raised in a, a martial arts background, um, you know, mom, little sister, man of the house, put myself through college, got a degree in sales and marketing, and then uh, pursued the California dream. So I moved out to California in 2013, got into medical sales. I did payroll for about 10 months and got into medical sales. And I've been doing that ever since, uh, really up until this last October. So I moved up to Seattle in 2017 to have my daughter, who's now three and a half years old. And present day, I'm a, you know, I'm a full-blown business owner. I left my job back in October, two months into my very first flip. <laughs> Had little to no investment experience, but just knew I would figure it out. And couldn't, couldn't, I just couldn't stand my job anymore. I, I loved my job. I loved the people, but I just, you know, making money for somebody else was really getting at me. And so i um, doing the real estate investing thing. I've got a girlfriend in law school. She's my life partner. You know, I haven't put a ring on it just yet, but that'll be happening. And uh, she's got a, a son from a previous. So we have a split family, but you know, all four of us parents are really close and we're moving to the Carolinas here in the next nine or 10 months together. So uh, again, pretty non-traditional, but all really good people, and and we're just all trying to crush it. So, we'll put a pin in that North Carolina thing because I got something for you. So that's a good that. Thank you because you just made my day. Yeah. See, my day just got so much better. Uh, oh, I love it, man. So you know what's interesting is there's something that a lot of people don't talk about as far as like I was reading something the other day, and like you're everybody's in sales. Like you're in sales with yourself, you're in sales with your spouse, your kids. And what I found is the the skills that you can obtain through a sales. Like I had an old ex-business partner who's like top 5% of Groupon for like 11 years in a row. He's a, he's a savage. And he just doesn't care. Like he'll literally call everybody. Like he's like, okay, great. Well, blah, blah, blah. A lot of people don't see that skill, right? Like, here's the deal. There's a lot of great salespeople out there that don't know anything about real estate. But if they took that skill and they realize what they know and they put it to this, man, they could supercharge their life. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I, I agree, man. I think exactly to your point, you hit the nail on the head where whether you want to be in sales or not, you are. Dating is sales, right? Getting a job is sales. Um, you know, teaching your kid is sales. Your kids are really the most aggressive salesmen out there. So... <laughs> You, you better be somewhat familiar with sales if, uh, if you have kids, but it's just such a transferable skill. And I think at the end of the day, um, you know, people buy from people they trust. And even if you're not in sales, it's still very much a people's business, you know, um, whether it's within the company or externally. So it's, I tell Kara all the time, I'm like, I think everybody should have, you know, people say everyone should have a job in, in the service industry, what it's like to serve people, customer service, retail, but also I think sales, what it's like to actually, work for commission and get paid based on your performance, understand people's problems and truly care about their problems and try to solve them. And it's just, yeah, it's a skill set that that will carry you uh, in many different facets of your life. And what is the, uh, cause it took me a long time to leave the restaurant business cause I wanted to leave for a long time. And I was just thinking about, we're coming up on my two year anniversary of being away from that. What was like, cause there's, we know everybody out there listening, like, 
what was eating away at you like weekly or daily? Like just, it's not like you weren't making good money. It's not like you weren't like, ha- you know, like you, you, you didn't, you didn't like hate the people you work with. Like what was eating away at you every day um, that eventually led you to just kind of burn the boats and, and do the real estate stuff? Yeah. Great question, man. So it was really just thinking bigger and where I was thinking, it wasn't aligned with where I was at. I knew that there was a ceiling. Um, 2019, I had the best year I've ever had financially. 2020, even with COVID was set to be, it was going to be my second best year. And uh, I, I just knew even with that, like I was, I was reaching a cap and I didn't really care about climbing the corporate ladder. A lot of times in my industry, managers actually make less than the reps. And so you know, I, I'm not in this to make, to make small coin, you know, I want to make as much money as possible to, to not only give back, but, you know, give my kids and, and, uh, my family a life that they've never really had. So I think the biggest thing is, is, is just, I was thinking bigger beyond corporate. And if you want to make that kind of money and you want to have that kind of success and freedom, you've got to, you've got to really be the man that worked for the man. So. And, um, how did you hear about real estate? What was your kind of window into that world? Yeah. So always been intrigued by real estate, even back in high school when new developments were going up, you know, strip malls and all that. I was always more intrigued about who was building them versus like the stores that were actually going in there. And so I've always just kind of been around it. Like when I moved to Newport Beach in California, my neighbor ran a a residential real estate office in Newport and he kind of, you know, plugged me with the whole, Hey, you could sell two homes and make an extra, you know, 80 grand a year, 50 grand a year or whatever. I was like, okay, that's pretty interesting. So moved up to Seattle, like I'd mentioned. And by this time, I was really getting the bug to do something. Um, What a lot of people don't know is I tried so many different things. I got my personal training certification. Uh, I thought I wanted to do, you know, health and fitness, but I realized I didn't want to monetize that. And I just kept just hearing about real estate. And I've always just known that, you know, nine out of 10 millionaires get there through real estate, or at least that's one of their vehicles. So got my license when I moved up here. Um, didn't really care for the broker life. I have a huge amount of respect for those people, but I just, I didn't want to do the broker life, at least on residential, went to a Tony Robbins event, met, uh, met a designated broker for a commercial real estate firm here in Seattle, started doing some calls on multifamily investors with, uh, two really successful brokers up here was definitely intrigued by it. I was like, man, commercial is the way to go, at least on the broker side. But again, I just, there was just something about it. It just wasn't clicking for me. And so this time last year I read out of state real estate investing with David Green. And I read uh, the Burr book by David Green. And that's when the light bulb went off. So initially, I was like, oh, man, I'm just going to build my portfolio like crazy and burr out of all these properties. But then I quickly realized you can't build capital doing that you can build your portfolio, but I need an active income. And I started looking into flips, I heard a little bit about wholesaling. And I just realized, man, that's my ticket out of the rat race. And then I'll build my portfolio, but I know I can build more capital doing flips and wholesaling than I can even in medical sales because A, I'm passionate about it and I love doing it. And, uh, and B, there's just, there's no cap, you know, there's really no cap. I'm working for myself. So right now I'm really, really focused on active income. Um, you know, even the active income can get to a passive standpoint. You know, if you build out your flipping company the right way, it can become more passive if you have the right people in place. But, um, you know, rentals and acquiring rentals are very much still on the radar. But I, like I said, I just needed to get out of the rat race as soon as possible, man. So that's how I got into it. And that was my journey. And what, and what in those books that you read, cause you did the broker, you did the commercial, you did the commercial, what was it about, or what, what key points in those two books kind of hit the, hit it for you? Yeah. So I think just the, the breakdown of how a burr works, where you're buying these distressed properties you know, pumping the equity into them or kind of forcing that equity and then refinancing out of them, the way that you can just exponentially increase your portfolio, um, you can do the same thing on the active side with flips. You know, you make 30 on a flip, you, you roll the money you had into the deal plus the 30 into the next one, you roll it and roll it and roll it and it compounds up. That was what was so mind blowing to me is just how much you can really accumulate. And then I think the other piece of it was, I saw a huge opportunity with out-of-state investing and the fact that it's really been around for quite some time, but it has a really bad rep because, you know, back before technology and Zillow and all this stuff, you'd get all these out-of-state investors getting burned because they didn't really have a pulse on their property. 
Well, today you get more people that are doing it. There's a buzz around it. But then with COVID, and that really made a lot of people realize that, oh, we can do stuff virtually. Um, I'm just kind of riding that that wave, man. So um, those were the two biggest things was the compounding and the virtual aspect. And what markets are you focused on currently? Uh, so I'm in Indiana. And then I'm with uh, Ryan, who was just on here in Missouri and Nebraska. And then I have a buddy down in South Carolina who wants to get ramped up as well. So, and, and then I, I also have some family in SoCal. I'm not quite in there yet, but yeah. And what, what gave you the confidence to invest in properties that are across the country from you? Um, so I would just say, you know, I ride the line of being, being humble, but confident. And I, I have a lot of confidence in my ability to vet people out. And I'm a big believer on you attract what you put into the universe. I know I have good intentions with people. I'm a good person. I truly believe I'll attract those kind of people. So I did a lot of pre-planning. You know, I built out templates of consistent questions to ask all these people. So I was calling real estate agents, calling contractors, property managers, everyone involved in a deal. I was just calling as many people as I possibly could. Uh, this time last year, I was on the phone all day, just constantly talking to people. So was vetting these people out. And eventually I just, I had a, a small team where I was like, okay, I, I have pretty much everyone in place. I have a wholesaler, an agent, a general contractor, who's also an investor and a property manager if I need to use that person. So a deal came along and, you know, I have a buddy who's a hard money lender that I went to college with. And I was like, the only reason I wouldn't jump right now is because I'm, I'm listening to my inner bitch voice. That's, that's it. So I've got to jump. And I just did. And what was that networking ever since? And what was, wh where was that first deal? What was it? Yep. So it was a single family home. Uh, it was a four bedroom, two bathroom house in Indiana, South Bend, Indiana. And we ended up converting it to a five, two. So we added another bedroom by just closing off a wall. And I originally had project, I got it for 81,000. I put about 55 into it and I was planning on listing it for 180. You know, the market had, had appreciated since then. I listed it for 200 and I accepted an offer at 193. So uh, overall, a, a successful flip, a shit show in many ways, but a successful flip, man. So I just haven't looked back since. And I had left my job halfway through that first one. I'm sure that went over well at home. <laughs> Dude, you, you want to know the crazy part, man? And this is where, you know, we've joked about getting Kara on here. And <laughs> dude, I would, dude, uh, we, we have to stop talking. I, right. No, for real, man. She, <laughs> dude, she's the look, she's the brain, she's everything. So I need to get out and I need to get ahead of her and make myself look a little good. Just so when she hops on here, we're at an equal playing field. But man, she, she was a huge push for me. Um, you know, I'll never forget the conversation we had last summer. And she said, listen, I don't care if we end up in a cardboard box. I trust that we're going to get this figured out and we're going to take care of our family. But she's like, one thing I know that you need to do is you need to leave your job. Yeah. You just have to. And so she was probably my biggest push behind it. And I had a lot of family support from my mom. My mom's very independent. You know, when I moved to California, she's like, good, get the hell out of here. Love you. Uh, my brother helped push me too. He's in medical sales. So I really did have a lot of support, man. And I, I you know, I'd be lying if I said that I just had the balls to do it because I was scared shitless. No, because you have to ask 70 people and then yeah, you have to, and right. then you have to get your own courage. And yep. you know what I always talk to my coach about? Like, look, look, let's just be honest. There's no need to go into details, but the two years of leaving the restaurant business has been a fucking banana boat. It's been crazy about all the shit that's happened, but I, but but regardless of how we got here today and where we'll be a year from now, I had to believe in something so hardcore that it was like in my, in my like way to describe it, it was my rocket ship out. Like I didn't give a fuck if it crashed and burned. I don't give a, I don't care if we made money, but I was like, I just did it. Like, by the way, yep. like I, I didn't, I didn't even tell my business partners. I was just like, I'm done. I, you got me full time. And like, it was, yeah. it was, it was nuts. And, 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 uh, and it's still, I mean, it's still nuts to this day, but at least I, I don't have to answer to anybody, but myself and yep. but here's, but here's what they don't tell you. That's the scariest person to answer to because right. you know right. what I'm saying? And because at the end oh, of the day, you have point. nobody else to, 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 to blame. <laughs> great point, man. Absolutely. You 
dude, you will do so much self-reflection when you don't have somebody giving you the parameters of a job. And, you know, it's really, really important to your point, man, that your head is pulled out of your ass. You know, your, your chin is up and you're doing everything that you need to do, you know, especially when you have other people that rely on you and count on you. So dude, that's a great point you made, man. Really good point. And, um, so you flipped the first one. What, what was the next deal that you did? Yeah. So the next deal, uh, was another, another small single family, a little bit of a smaller deal is a 53,000 purchase price, uh, about 35 into it and sold it for 127. And that was in the same market. And I got mm-hmm. started on that one about a month later. And keep in mind, man, the one thing I, I, I haven't done is, and you know, you, everyone kind of teeters off a little bit and, you know, you got to kind of check yourself and stuff. So I, you know, I've had my days and stuff like that, but I've always just been on the gas with hard money lenders and right, raising private money and talking with different people. But um, yeah, so I was able to do that second deal with a different hard money lender. And then I, I started my third deal with a buddy of mine. He basically brought the down payment on the hard money. And he brought a lot of like his systems and processes kind of brain to the table and really helped me with some of that stuff. And uh, yeah, we did a third deal. And then I would gotten money back from my first two flips. I rolled on my fourth and fifth one. And then I actually just today closed on my sixth flip, which was my first fully funded private deal. Like no hard money, no nothing, completely passive, just wired the money, the title. And uh, yeah, we're going to be doing quite a few deals with this guy, hopefully. So it was a big win. Yeah. And, and, and ultimately there's like, I have a coaching client who does some wholesales in like the, the mechanism of the, of the flip or the, of the wholesale is depending on how you look at your life or the systems you put in is maybe not something you want to do for an extended period of time, but in the short term, it can be a mechanism to create the capital that you need. And then the compound, the compound effect of that over and over again, really changes the game when you, when you don't have to get a lender, when you can fund it yourself, things can move a lot quicker and you don't have to answer it to anybody. And, and so if yep. you, if you need a way out, if you need a way to start, it, it's definitely, it, it, it can be done for sure. Yep. Yep. I agree, man. Yeah. I wouldn't want to, you know, obviously flip houses for the rest of my life. I mean, and I say that in this kind of position now, you know, I listened to a podcast uh, about a month ago and the guy made a great point. His flipping business is almost completely passive just because of everybody that he has in place. Mm-hmm. And it, it's a really good point, man. It's like the C and the D quadrant of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. You have your big business and then you have your, you know, your passive investments. And so I do love flipping. Um, I, you know, I love the wholesaling as well. They're just two different things. But my goal is to build companies around those two things where it does become more passive. Because I just, I had the mindset, man, where I would rather team up with more people and feed more hands and hire more people and take less of a margin, but you're doing so much, so much more at scale. You know, you have five, six teams and, you know, five, six different markets. Yeah. Your, your expenses are higher. You have more people that you're controlling, but at the same time, it's like, you're building a company, you're building a culture. And I just, I just keep, I try to keep that macro mindset. Like I don't want to be a mom and pop shop company where, yeah, sure. My margins might be, you know, a lot better because I don't have as much help and I'm doing more myself, but I would rather take less and just have more at scale. Well, I think, yeah, I get that. But I think the bigger reason behind you, just because I know you a little bit, because you're like me, I think, I think that what drives you drives me is, is I just want to create jobs. Yeah. Like yeah. I've worked with amazing people my whole life, especially in the restaurant business. And there's so many amazing people that don't want to be millionaires and don't want to work 90 hours a week that, that, that are moms or whatever that are that are fucking gangsters at what they do, but they yeah. work for, they work for crappy bosses. And so I look right. at how many jobs I can create within my companies. And, 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 and when I'm always in a bad mood or something like, I think to myself like, yeah, but there's people that, that matter right? You matter. So like the harder you charge, the, the harder you go, the more your impact you're going to be able to create. Yep. Great point, man. Absolutely. There's, I, there is truly not a better feeling than being able to bring somebody business and making them feel like they're a part of the team. Cause obviously they are even on the smallest levels. Like last week, I got a picture from my contractor of a receipt. He went and bought some materials for a job. 
you know, his hands are all dirty. I looked at the receipt. It says 7:41 PM. He's got a kid. He's got a wife. He's got a baby on the way. And dude, I just sit back and I say, man, this, this dude is at a big box store right now at 7:41 at night. And I just sent him a message and I just expressed my gratitude towards him. And we got on a call a couple of days ago and I said, look, man, I'm not here to win. I'm here to dominate. And I want to make sure you know, are you willing and able to scale? Because I want to help you grow. And I want, I want you to feed your family and give them a good life. And there's just, there's just not a better feeling, man. There's really not. You're spot on. How's everybody doing guys. I want to talk today about our sponsor for May, you know, a good friend of mine, Mark Simpson runs a company, uh, boostly.co.uk guys. Everybody knows that I'm in the short-term rental space for many years. And I think one of the reasons One of the quotes he said to me was, you can't build your real estate on somebody else's property. And it really resonated with me because we are so reliant on an Airbnb, a home away, these systems, right? And headed into this year, it's very important that we get direct bookings and they're the best in the business at this. So in 2021, everybody needs to be building a website to create direct bookings and you can't rely on Airbnb plus you're giving them a ton of money. And so 64% of all the websites are powered by WordPress and these uh, private message companies that offer you the free website, they're not on WordPress. And so it's this trick that they're doing. And, you know, these guys are the best in the business, the best in the world. And I'm not just saying that uh, because I use them. I'm saying that because they are. It's the simple fact is that they, they service over 600 clients worldwide and you need to get this done and you can get it started for as little as 99 bucks a month. And you could do that with one property, a hundred properties, but you need to be capturing emails. You need to be sending uh, direct marketing back to these guests. And the way to do that is to create a website. And these guys are the best in the business. When you get direct bookings, you're saving money every year and the profit margins can be exponential. And so if you want to learn more about them, head on over to boostly.co.uk slash construct your life. Not only is Mark a great entrepreneur and CEO, but he's a great person as well. Well, think about it this way. And this is what I tell everybody. If you can understand that you're not flipping houses, you're feeding families, game changes straight up. Yes. And like, we're always looking at the numbers. We're always saying, well, this is going to do this and everything. Like, fuck all that shit. Like there are, (laughs) there are people that depend on you. Like, here's the deal. And I just know this because I've talked to a million big flippers. There's a lot of times, like even home builders, put it that way. There's a lot of times they're not making a huge profit on the house. They just need to keep their guys busy. They need to keep their guys fed. And like, when you start hearing that, you're like, oh, game's different. Like, like, you know, there's seasons, right? Where the profit's going to be huge. And there's seasons where you got to write it out. And and you got to understand that if you don't have them, you don't have anything. Like, there's no chance that you could do what you do. You live in fucking Seattle and the shit's across the country. If you didn't have these people. And so like what I do, right, is I make, I take my coaching clients, I make them take a personality test because I want to know how they want to be congratulated. Like not everybody's the same way. Right. And so if I know how they want to be like, there's people that need, right. I have have coaching clients that want to talk to me every day, like text. Then I have guys, I just talk to them one day a week. It's like they're they're doing their thing. Everybody's different. But, 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 but we, we were doing a podcast on the previous one and, and Sky said something that like blew us away is you have to understand that your values as a human, what you need, if you're trying to get other people to live off of your values, it's going to be a long life for you. Right. Right. Like the here's the deal that, plan. that guy, like that dude, right. That investor might love Lamborghinis. Like I'm being dead serious. And maybe as a kid, him and his father worked on like fancy cars and that's what he dreamed of. So for you to look at him, and I'm not saying that there's not douchebags out there, but for you to look at him and say, fuck that guy. Maybe he's worked his whole life to have that, right? And I bring up your motorcycle. Like, fuck off, bro. Like, like th- right. you don't know what it does to me, and I'll, and I'll do you one better. This is, this is the other thing he said. Be careful that you're not living somebody else's injected values. Absolutely. Great yeah. point. Yeah, man. Because, I mean, that's going to eat at you, even on a subconscious level, even if you don't realize it right away. Because I think to your point, you know, a lot of people by nature and not in a bad way at all, 
um, our followers, they want to be a part of something else, right? I just listened to this video in the RTA syndicate by Ed Milet. He says that a lot of people just want to be a part of something. I mean, even on a neg- the negative side of things, you see that shit going on in society today where people just want to be a part of something that is created by, you know, the, the political elite, so to speak. But then on the flip side, they could also be a part of something like a really, really cool culture where like, you know, to your point earlier, they don't want to be these millionaires. You know, they want to, they want to buy into something that's aligned with them. And I think that's really important, you know, and, you know and we, if you're, yeah, if you're, yeah. And we, as entrepreneurs and we, as entrepreneurs and leaders of that business have to be very careful that we, that we paint the, the vision. Right. And I have, and I'm just as guilty of like talking a lot. And then like, you know, these investors, some things fall through, some things don't. And like realizing that I have to, like, I have to paint the picture if it's actually there. You can't get everybody excited. Right. And right. one of my favorite, one of my favorite quotes is I've used it like 70 times in the last week is like, is like the, the problem, the, the, the problem with communication is the illusion that it's happened. Right. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I know. When I heard that, I was like, I was like, one sentence just changed my whole life. Like, and I was like, yeah, because, because we have to, we have to ask like when you're pushing, when you're, when you're driving your team, when you're, when you're pushing your business partners, like, like I remember this, God, this had to been like one of my first businesses. My business partner texted me one night and he's like, Hey dude, you're like a locomotive, bro. Like we, we don't roll like you. He's like, if you roll everybody like this, you're not going to have any business partners. And that's when I was like, Oh, okay. Like they're, they, they just operate different. Okay. Well, I need a, I can handle what I can handle, but I don't need to dump it all on them. Yeah. 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 Right. Right. Absolutely, man. Yeah. And that's a, you know, that's, that's, I was going to say, that's something that, you know, I, I struggle with, you know, at times where I'm the same kind of way, man, like I can just full steam ahead. I'm going to do what I need to do to get it done, pile it on. And, you know, not everybody's like that, nor does everybody want to be like that. And so I balance this, you know, as a CEO or as a business owner, you should be doing the most. You should be there the earliest. You should be leaving the latest. Uh, But you also want to make sure that you're going into business with the right people. And you also want to make sure to your point, like where you're aligning with the right values with people, you know, and and it's just, yeah, it's, it's something that I spend a lot of time thinking about around just like culture and what people believe in and what you believe in and understanding that there's going to be some differences, but as a whole, you need to be aligned, you know, I couldn't it's agree a tough, more. tough what, thing uh, to balance, but what, uh, what got like, you're flipping, you're making money. So where did this wholesale thing come from? Yeah, for sure, man. So, um, I joined seven figure flipping and I met Ryan who was on here earlier and the dude is just awesome, man. He's such a great guy. He's a hustler and we just clicked. We clicked really well. And he was like, Hey, listen, I'm going to be doing this wholesaling thing. I know you're doing some flips, but I was kind of understanding too, that with flips, it's, you know, it's, it's a longer project. Of course, you're not getting this quicker capital. So I just said, Hey man, like what, what value can I bring? You know, like I don't mind hopping on the phones and making some dials and stuff. So we just got started and we've done four, four deals, four or five deals since October. So nothing too crazy, but our spreads have been really good and our, our cost has been really low. And so we're looking to expand and, you know, get a cold caller going and things like that. So um, it was just the quick transactions, you know, and the, the sales part of it that I like. It's it's one of those things where it can be done properly. It can be done as long as you don't let it run your life because it can, but it can inject cash into your business very quickly. And more importantly, it just gives you another option, right? right. Like right. you don't know who you're going to meet, you know, you're doing a deal. Now, my issue with wholesalers is they're very transactional and they don't look at the big picture. Like I try to tell all these young kids all the time, but they don't listen. Of course they don't fucking listen. So whatever, <laughs> you got to leave a little meat on the bone for the investors, like, especially these big dogs, right? Especially doing it in Austin, especially when the numbers get really high and you're trying to squeeze every dollar out of them. And they, you know, whether it was your fault or not, they screw up on a deal. They're not going to work with you. again. And if you don't have buyers, you don't have anything. Yeah. Great point, man. Absolutely. And that's one thing that, you know, I think being on the flipping side, we've been very conscientious of, is making sure that there's still meat on the bone and that it makes sense. Of course, you want to maximize your return, but you know, I, I've always asked myself, and Ryan does the same thing when we come together: is 
you know, if we were to flip this house, would this price make sense? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Cause like you said, you got to look at the bigger picture and you want repeat customers and you want to build a good buyer's list. So, so, uh, how are you sourcing all these deals? That's what everybody wants to always know. Yes. Yeah, so like the flips or the wholesale? Uh, let's start with the flips. So with the flips, uh, the market that I originally started in, uh, just leverage relationships with wholesalers and investor friendly agents. You know, I, I don't really have a huge desire to get into that market and start wholesaling because I appreciate the relationships. I could really, I couldn't care any less if, you know, how much the wholesaler is making on the deal, as long as it makes sense to me. So I'm doing, you know, I'm, I'm sourcing it through just good old networking. And then, um, let's see in the wholesaling market we're in, it's, it's basically just been cold calling and some SMS and ringless voicemails. So I've just been calling these people and hopping on the phone with them. And it's, you know, I'm, I'm getting out of that a little bit where we're getting a cold caller. I'll still handle some of the more the delicate lists, like, you know, probate and, you know, tax delinquent and stuff like that. But yeah. And what do you, what do you say to these people when you call? You don't got to give it all yeah, away. I just, what do you say? What do you say? No, for sure, man. I'm just super chill. I give them a call and I, you know, Hey, my name's Chris. I know this is a super random call. If you don't know who I am. I'm a local real estate investor in, in the area. And was just calling about your property on one, two, three main street. And not sure if you own it, what the situation's like, but just want to see if you consider an offer. And from there, you know, they'll, well, you know, who is this? How'd you get my list or, or how my get my number? You know, I'll, I'll tell them how, or they say, well, what's your offer? A lot of people say that, what's your offer? And I've, I've been very careful with that one because you don't want to sit there and waste a bunch of time with these people if they're trying to get top dollar for a rehab property, right? So I'll say, hey, that's a great question. Can I sp spend the next five to 10 minutes asking you questions about the property? And if they give you the five to 10 minutes, you know, there's probably some motivation there. And so I'll go through, I'll ask them some questions on the property, you know, just start macro working towards the inside of the property. And, uh, you know, from there, I'll just say, hey, listen, I, I certainly value your time. I know you value your time. This does take me about 20 to 30 minutes to run these comps. So, you know, with our time being valuable, are you motivated if I call you back? Are you willing to sign and, and close on an offer if, if the deal makes sense? And I'll just ask them straight up. And I, but I, I try to word it in a way where it's like, hey, I value your time, but I also value mine. And so you got to be, you've got to really ride that line of like, you know, being stern with them and, and not wasting your time, but also being respectful. And I very much have this, this talk track and use, you know, my, as far as my tonality and all that of, and I'll say this sometimes I'm like, Hey, listen, you know, the deals don't always make sense for us. We don't buy every house we look at. Uh, but if it does make sense for myself and it makes sense for you, are you prepared to move forward? And that lets them know that like, I'm not desperate. Like I'm, I'm not, I don't have to buy your house. I'm not going to, you know, be a, a car salesman with you. No, I love um, that. And I, I don't, I don't, you know, agents and like, cause a lot of my friends are agents. They give, they give up too much of themselves. Like, like, look, you, you can't look, I get it. Build a rapport, build a relationship, but you can't spend 30 or 40 minutes with everybody. Cause you're not literally not going to get through five houses in a day. So you, right. you have to, okay. you, you know, are you are, you know, time in the field is not as important as effective time in the field. hundred percent agree. Yep. Very well said, man. Cause you can, it's like the class just came up know. with it right there. So, Oh, did you really? Yeah. My man, you need to trademark that. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was good though. I mean, but seriously, you're right. It's, it's, you know, you're busy, but are you productive? You know, it's that same kind of thing. Cause yeah, if I talk to, you know, if I make 50 dials and I talk to six people and it was a waste of time, you know, when I could have gotten them off the phone a lot sooner, you know, cause I'll, yeah, I, I just have no problem telling people that, Hey, it just, I don't really feel like this is a good fit. You don't really seem super motivated straight up, mm -hmm. you know? Well, no, you know, and then they'll either, yeah, yeah, I agree. Cool. You get off the phone. That's fine. You follow up with them in a month, but sometimes they'll be like, well, you know, I'm interested or they'll kind of open up a little more for So yeah. Yeah. It's no, I love it. Now we got, all, now we got all the boring stuff out of the way. Uh, we'll talk for the next couple of minutes about what we actually care about, uh, which is mindset, <laughs> mindset and stuff like that. You're, you're a dad, you have two kids, you have, you know, trying to like create this new space, m multiple companies, you're, you're trying to be a, a partner and she's in law school, which I would imagine is very uh, time consuming as well. 
you know, how yep. do you, how do you stay, you know, not everybody's happy all day and not everything goes great, but how do you stay so focused and driven every day? Yeah. Great question, man. Um, it's certainly not always easy, uh, but I would say the first thing is, is structure. You know, Kara and I sit down every Sunday and we go over the previous week's goals and we break down our goals, you know, personal, what we want to accomplish, what's going on in the business, our health and our fitness, and then our parenting. And so I think just having that structure and having that accountability and something to kind of fall back on, like when your day gets crazy, you can resort to your structured schedule, I think is big. Um, And then I think it's just, it's really just being conscious of what you're consuming and where you're surrounding yourself, man, because confidence is a like true confidence. It seems like it's almost, it's a really rare thing and it comes through hard work and it comes through being aligned with, you know, the way that you think and the way that you act in life need to be aligned. And so, you know, if you're not happy with the way that you look, you need to get your ass in the gym, period, plain and simple, dude. If you're skipping out on your calls, you need to make your damn dials because when you start doing stuff that you say you're going to do, it gives you this confidence and it just becomes like a freaking freight train and you become unstoppable. And so when you have this structure and you have this confidence, you're pretty much just unfuckwithable. I mean, honestly, and it, it, it's just so important, man. And it, it's, it's a passionate subject for me. I get really, I'm a no excuses kind of guy and sometimes I can lack empathy, but <laughs> Yeah. Is there, so does your, does your audio match your video? Right, right. Exactly. Well, here's a prime example, true story. And I won't call them out by name. There's no need to, but I got, I got coaching clients. You know, it's COVID. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. I, I had a mustache and a shaved head. Cause I had, I couldn't go to the barber too, but you know, a couple of these guys, you know, I meet them, they, they want help. They're, they're, their beards long. They wear, you know, they wear a fucking hoodie every day. They, they now got a haircut. And I said, dude, get your fucking shit together. And they're like, they're like, they're like, but wait, I don't give a fuck what other people think about me. Well, yeah, I know that. I don't care what other people think about me either, but guess what? The person that's looking in the mirror cares and you may, and you may think that it doesn't matter. True story. And I'll be a hundred percent honest, dude, I'm in this chair most of the day, bro. Like, Three, like we had to go for a walk today because I hadn't been outside three days, you know, like, yeah. like fucking yeah. rolling. Right. Yeah. But what's interesting, right. Is when I go out, like I have to do a podcast in a minute and like we're going to Miami for a wedding this weekend. Like I'm starting to, I'm starting like not fancy, but I'm starting to dress better. And it's not, yeah. I'm not doing it for anybody else, but it just makes me feel good. And so I, I get it guys. I get that you don't give a fuck what other people care, but don't you dare tell me that it doesn't matter that you're 60 pounds overweight. Don't you dare tell me that wearing the same sweatshirt three months in a row, it matters. It matters because here's what's crazy about people. Everybody's standards of other people are very high, yet their personal standards are really low. Yes, absolutely, man. It's so easy to cast out, right? And and look at other people. But then when you look internally, you're like, oh, oh, should I do the same thing? you know? Mm-hmm. And so in alluding to your point, as far as even on like the haircut, man, on such a micro level, that stuff plays a huge role. And I love the whole concept of, you know, you look good, you feel good. If you feel good, you're going to do good, you know? And if you do good, it's just a revolving cycle. And so same kind of thing. I'll, you know, I won't shave for a little while and I'll just kind of feel just grimy. I'll just feel kind of grimy. You know, my workout maybe sucked that day and it really does weigh down, weigh you down. But when you get a, you know, a fresh haircut, you get up on time, you hit the gym, it, it makes you not only act more on that, but then you're able to reflect on, man, these last few days were, were tough. I need to step it up. Well, here's the biggest thing is people like me and you, they think that we want to. Motherfucker, that f- right. <laughs> I'm, on a, I'm on a new regiment right now at 4 a.m. I don't want to. Yeah, By no stretch talking. of the imagination, right? But here's the deal. I needed to start. I've been really bad never really got into journaling. Well, I wanted to put that in my thing. Well, I started 75 hard again. I want to put that in. I have time to get that in, but I want to make sure I get it in. And so, dude, there's a lot, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of times I don't, there's a lot of times I don't want to do it, but I biohacked myself. And what I mean by that is about 10 o'clock, my day starts getting away from me. Like I'm normally rolling through Zooms till probably like six or seven, right? And so what I've done is I make sure that I knock out my 75 heart, all of it in the morning. Because nice. I don't I don't have it weighing on my head the whole day. Like 
You know what I'm saying? Like, and people are like, yep. Oh, I never, I never thought of that. And I'm like, do you know how many times life happens and you, <laughs> something happens and you can't get to that next one. Right. You can't, you can't, uh, you have to understand that you have to give yourself the time necessary to get things done. And, um, right. you know, they'll come to me and they'll be like, this is my favorite one. And I, I don't care if there's 90 people on the zoom, I'll call them right out. It's like, man, well, I want to, I want to do this and I want to do that. And I want to do this. And, and, uh, and I'm like, well, what time do you get up? And they're like eight o'clock. I'm like, fuck off. You're done, bro. Like, <laughs> right. It's like you're done. You're done. Yep. You're done. Because here's the deal. You get up at eight, then eh, eight 30. And then like, you get moving by like nine. And here's the deal. I'm going to be very clear about this. Cause I want to make sure I don't piss off everybody. If you're a night person, then do your stuff at night. That's not what I'm saying. Yeah. Just make right. sure you give yourself the time. That's all I'm saying. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. Spot on. And actually, Kara and I have gone through that where, yeah, man, her creative side, it, you know, it, it is a little bit in the morning, but she can really get going at night. And so that's what works for her. You know what I mean? And I, on the other hand, I love being up at 445, 5 a.m. Now, I say that carefully. I always love it, right? But that's where I'm most creative and that's where I'm getting going. And like you said, I get a lot of my shit, shit done. I get a workout in. I read. Sometimes I'll hit my workouts midday, but it's, yeah, you really got to find what works for you and you've got to really pay attention to, you know, kind of what your, your green zone is, your yellow zone and your red zone, you know, and when you hit road roadblocks and stuff and every day is going to be a little different, but you know, it, yeah, it's, what's, what's what that? Saying. Explain to me the, the, explain to me the, the red, yellow, cause I use something similar in business. I'm curious what yours, what, what you <laughs> Yeah, for sure. So there's a productivity coach in our mastermind in seven figure flipping. And she talks about how you have your green, your yellow and your red zone. So green is obviously when you're most productive, you're full steam ahead. Yellow is when you you're productive, but you're not as, as plugged in as when you're like really first charged and you kind of start to taper off. And then red is just when you hit your, hit your roadblock. You know, a lot of times for people, it's right after lunch. Um, they just hit this wall. And so you've got to structure your day to where you're doing your most productive stuff during your green zone, mm -hmm. you know, and, and then there's, there's ways to, like you said, hack it where, you know, for me, like sometimes I'll take a 17 minute power nap and it's 17 minutes, you know, and that will just get me going through the afternoon. And then there's other times where I'm like, I don't have time for it. I just need to, to just, you know, biohack to your point, kick that inner bitch voice and just just plug through. I mean, there, there is just some grit to it, man. And a lot of people don't talk about that, but there is just some, some grit. Yeah. So. It's, it's all day to day. <laughs> yes. Yeah, right. But, but what I've done is separate. Right. So I've had, I've had extremely long three days, like so Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday this week. And then next week, the same thing on yeah. Thursday, I got like two meetings, like maybe on Friday, we're flying to Miami. I got nothing. And then like, yep. not only that, my, my massage guys come in tomorrow afternoon. And so I go front heavy, by yep. the way, if you haven't done this, that's, we, we need to talk about this offline. I'll talk to you about what you need I'm to do. curious, man. Change, yeah. your, change my entire life. He, Did it really? he works for, uh, he works for Aubrey Marcus down in on gym and here in Austin. And he's a, he's a body work guy. And so it's not a, like he's a physical therapist. He's a whatever. So before COVID, I was getting a massage a week and, yeah. and I, I couldn't, and I, I, he got recommended by a friend and, and what I didn't realize is I take on so much people's energies, like my coaching, right. You're, you're helping them and I can't get yeah. it out. Right. And so he comes in, um, we, we turn on like an hour and a half of massage music. Uh, my phone goes on do not disturb, which is probably the only time of the week that happens. And I literally either fall asleep or I meditate for like an hour and a half and like slip in, like I'll close some loops in my brain. And yep. when I, when I get out, my girlfriend's like, I don't even know who you are. Like you look like your face looks different. And so that's crazy. And so what's wild, right? I was talking to somebody the other day who I really respect. And she was like, think of it this way. He, he, what you do and what you give back, like you can't not do this. Like you can't not do this. And right. my buddy, my buddy right. always says like healers need healers. And it's so true. And like, 
it's like a reset on my week. Like, it's like, okay, like plants it over. And like, and so it's very hard for me. Right. Because one of the things that I'm struggling with so bad is I, I don't stretch. I hate fucking stretching. Oh and, man. And I just, uh, I, it's like, it's like my little dark secret. I can't do it. I, I, I hate know, it so I'm, much. Like, dude, and here's the deal. Here's the deal. I would literally pay somebody to come over three times a week for 30 minutes because then I would know I would do it. Now I'm just right. thinking about that. I might just do that. Uh, yeah, seriously. And you like, that's what I'm saying. Like biohack yourself, figure stuff out that you have to do because you know, you need to do it. More importantly, here's the most important thing. Give yourself permission to do it. And then, and right. then, and then you can go. So if people want to find out more about your journey, I think I shared way too much of my own stuff on that, but, uh, sorry oh, guys, I you got it. into my life. I loved it. Uh, how people find out about your journey. Yeah, for sure. So I'm, um, you know, Facebook, Instagram, um, you know, social media, C Gorm 12, C G O R M 12. And then also the company network ventures group, Facebook, Instagram, and uh, yeah, just anybody listening to this that wants to talk about mindset, real estate, you know, parenting. I mean, I do not have it all figured out, not even close, but there's obviously some things that are working in my life and I'm always happy to pay it forward and have conversations with people. So please reach out. I'd love to hear from you guys. Love it. Guys, if you like this episode, make sure you send it out to your friends, rate us and review us. We'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to Construct Your Life with Austin Lenny. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to rate, review, subscribe, and pay it forward by sharing with a friend. Most importantly, take this opportunity to start constructing your life by taking immediate action on what you learned. For show notes, resources, and more information on one-on-one coaching with Austin, visit constructyourlifepodcast.com.